it sure has been my joy and Helen's joy to be here this week. And we have appreciated the hospitality uh, and, uh, and the opportunity just to be a part uh, of St. Thomas Independent uh, over these last few days. And uh, we're, we're going to miss you folks. Uh, I hope I have behaved myself well enough that maybe I can get invited back again sometime. Uh, but, uh, uh, but I do want to say I also appreciate I got this beautiful card last night from some of the young ladies uh, in the church, uh, some, of the, some of the young girls. <laughs> and uh, I, I really hate to read it because it's not really true, but I appreciate the sentiment anyway. It says, uh, thank you for being a great preacher. Jesus loves you. And it was from Veronica and Abigail. And I appreciate that very much. And so that's going home with me. And uh, uh, that's a great memento of the, uh, of the time together here. I appreciate that very, very much. Uh, and I've just enjoyed being here. Now, it is Wednesday night, the last night of the meeting. And so uh, uh, I've preached pretty nice up till now. I've been good to you. So I'm going to be rough tonight because, I mean, I'm, I'm gone after this. <laughs> So, I can, uh, so I've got my roughest sermon for the for the last night, uh, and uh, we'll we'll do our best. Uh, but if you have your Bible, we'll turn in a moment. But if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and find the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number five, and we're going to begin reading in verse number thirteen. Matthew chapter number five. We'll begin reading in verse thirteen. While you're turning there, let me say that uh, I do miss Nottingham. I've been pastoring at Nottingham for twenty-three years, and uh, and uh, uh, I always love to be in uh, new churches and meet new folks, and uh, and I enjoy preaching out. And I've done a lot of it. Uh, I had about three years there where we were really trying to get the Mercy Project going, trying to get uh, interest in uh, people supporting the boat, the ship ministry, and so I was gone about 20, 22 weeks out of the year, not 22 Sundays, of course, but 20, 22 times during the week uh, out of the year. And uh, boy, I missed being home uh, and I missed uh, being at Nottingham during the week during that period of time. I told somebody one, this is the honest truth. I woke up one morning in a motel. And I had to go over to the book that they have in the motel where it tells you everything. I had to open the book to find out what town I was in. I, I had forgotten where I was at. Totally didn't have a clue. Uh, I, I am kind of glad that I don't travel quite that much uh, anymore. But I, the Lord still gives me opportunity to preach out. And I appreciate that and love it. But I do miss uh, Nottingham when I'm away. And I've been away two Wednesdays and a Sunday. And uh, so uh, I really am uh, missing them. Was praying for Michael. He'll be preaching tonight uh, that the Lord had used him there at Nottingham. Uh, and our service starts the same time yours does, seven o'clock. So he's probably getting in the pulpit right about now too. So I'm remembering him and pray that the Lord will use him great. But there at Nottingham, we've had the same um, auditorium Bible uh, teacher for a long, long time. Harry Middleman has been teaching the auditorium Bible class uh, um, maybe not as long as I can remember. He hasn't been there the full 23 years that I have, but he's been there close to that long. Uh, and he does a great job, uh, but he's from New Jersey, okay? Uh, now, I know people can get saved in New Jersey, but it's more difficult. <laughs> It is. You know, I've been to New Jersey. I know. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's where the ship is right now. Uh, and I have to pray and pray and pray as I'm approaching uh, the New Jersey line. Uh, Lord, uh, protect me while I'm here. Uh, and, uh, and, and But there is one good thing about going to New Jersey. The gas is a lot cheaper there. I don't know why, but it's a lot cheaper. But anyway, uh, he's from New Jersey, him and his wife both. And they're, they're wonderful people and they're typical New Jersey. I mean, they really are. They haven't lost their accent said or their, uh, or their mannerisms or anything. And, uh, but they're a very, very sweet couple. Been married, I don't know, years and years. And, uh, their son is our pianist and, uh, and, uh, their daughter-in-law and two so uh, grandsons are just as sweet as they could be. And they were out shopping. Did you know, uh, Helen and I went shopping today. We went, uh, I'm sure y'all never heard of the place called the, uh, street of shops in Lewisburg. Anybody ever, ever hear of that place? Uh, well, this is about our fifth time to be there. Uh, every time we're in this 
this area, we wind up there at one point or another. So we were there for a little while today. But one day uh, they were out shopping uh, and uh, Harry had promised Jen he was going to spend the whole day with her and anywhere she wanted to shop, he was going to go and he was just going to, you know, he wasn't going to rush her, just let her have her way and do the shopping and be the, be the sweet husband that, that she needed that day. And so they were in a shop looking around and, uh, and then all of a sudden Jen turned around and Harry was gone. I mean, he was nowhere to be found. She even went out the door uh, of the shop and looked down one side of the street, down the other side. And then she walked back in the shop and she thought, Harry has run out on me. Uh, he's, he said he was going to spend the whole day with me and now he's just run off. Uh, so, uh, so she called him on the phone uh, and he answered the phone and she said, Hair. Where, that's the way she talks, by the way. She said, Hair, where are you? You just disappeared. And he said to her, he said, oh, Jen, do you remember when we first got married and we didn't have any money and we went into that jewelry store and you saw that beautiful gold locket necklace and, and, and you wanted it so bad. You said, oh, I would just love to have that locket. And I told you, I said, honey, uh, one day, one day you'll get that locket. One day I'll, I'll get it for you. Do you remember that? And she would just melt it, of course. And she said, oh, hair. Oh, yes, of course, my love. I remember that so well. And he said, well, I'm at the McDonald's right across the street. If you want to come down here, I'll get you a Big Mac. So, so, so that's the depths of his uh, uh, ro uh, romantic intentions. And, uh, but anyway, I told that story one Sunday morning. Uh, and... Uh, uh, and uh, about half of my church members believed it was true. <laughs> and so uh, some of them came back to Jen and they said, Jen, I just can't believe Harry would do that. And she said, oh, yeah. <laughs> the story isn't true, by the way. <laughs> but they believed it and they and she really agged it on. So it was a, it was a couple of weeks before some of our folks figured out that I was just making it up as I went along. But anyway, if you have your Bible and you've turned uh, to Matthew chapter number. Yeah, if you're one of my church members, you got to watch out. Yeah. I got all kinds of stories on my church members and they have a great time with it too. Uh, as a matter of fact, they wonder which one of them is going to be in the next sermon. You know, am I going to be in his sermon this week? And some of them just can't wait. I got a little boy, his name's Carter, and he's been in a couple of my sermons. Uh, and he's about, uh, what's Carter, four years old? He's four years old. He's as redheaded as he can be. Uh, and he's the cutest little guy you've ever seen. And I've used him a couple of times uh, and he just can't wait to be in the uh, to be mentioned from the pulpit by the preacher. He's just constantly, uh, you know, uh, waiting uh, for it to happen again. But anyway, enough of that. Let's turn to Matthew chapter number five, verse number 13. Uh, if you'd stand with us, please, in honor of the reading of the word of God. This is a very familiar passage of scripture again, uh, but I really want to look at this uh, just a little bit different. Uh, as we begin, it may sound very familiar to messages that we've heard from this passage of Scripture, but there's one part that I really want to look at tonight, and I, I want to look at it from a little different light than we may have looked at it before. Jesus is speaking and preaching on the Sermon on the Mount, and he said, "'You're the salt of the earth.'" But if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is therefore good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light under all that are in the house. Dear Lord, we pray that you'd help us in the understanding of Scripture tonight. And Lord, I know this message is a little different than any of the ones I've preached here so far. And uh, so, Lord, I pray that it might be received in the spirit it's given, taken for that good part that would uh, take hold in our life to conform us of to, uh, to the image of your son and make us useful in the kingdom of God. And Lord, you know me. You know I'm a weak and a feeble servant at best. So I pray tonight that you might, uh, uh, Lord, that you might cleanse me afresh and use me for your glory. Uh, in all of my undeservingness, Lord, I pray that nonetheless you would make me a vessel fit for the master's use. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> the, this is the Sermon on the Mount that we're looking at here. And, uh, verses 3 through 12 that immediately precede this passage of Scripture are what we call the Beatitudes. And uh, as a matter of fact, in my notes, when I write Beatitudes, I capitalize the B and the A. And the reason I do that is because I want to remind me, myself of what the Beatitudes are. Uh, these are the B attitudes. In other words, these are the attitudes that we're supposed to have in our life. Uh, and an attitude is the way you look at things. Have you, ever, uh, have you ever noticed that one of the most difficult things to get across to somebody is that they have a bad attitude? Because the minute you say, you know... I really believe you got to, and you can say it as sweet and kind and gentle as possible, but you say, you know, I'm I'm afraid you might have a bad attitude. What? Me? A bad attitude? I don't have a bad attitude. Well, (laughs) doesn't take very long to figure out that that's not exactly a good attitude. Uh, But we, uh, uh, but, but our attitudes are our perspective. It's the way we see the world. It's the way we look at things. It's the way we respond to things. It's, it's what's inside of us coming out. The B attitude. Attitudes or the attitudes that be in our life is a manifestation of what's really in our heart. And can I say to you, if we can learn the Beatitudes, verses 3 to 12, and put them into practice in our life, that will put our heart right. And then if our heart right, our actions will follow. If, what, if, if what's right, uh, if what's in our heart is really genuine and true and good and right uh, in the presence of of the Lord, then, our, then what our hands do and what our lips say and what, what we let come through the eye gate and the ear gate of our body, when, we, when our attitudes are right, then all these other things are going to fall into place uh, and our attitudes are going to dictate that our life be right. And immediately after Jesus tells us how to get our heart right in the Beatitudes, then he says to us, if your heart is right, if you are living in such a manner to manifest the uh, the right perspective uh, from God's point of view to a lost and dying world, then you need to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And it is those who are walking with Christ and who have a right heart attitude with him that can be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Uh, I graduated from uh, Liberty University. I said that the other, uh, the other uh, night. Uh, and, um, as a matter of fact, I was in the bookstore, one of the bookstores today and, uh, in the antique store and there was one had Christmas in America and I just opened it up, was flipping through it. Uh, and I think it was written back in the, uh, late eighties. The book was written. Uh, and as I was flipping through it, I saw a picture of Dr. Jerry Falwell, uh, and his wife, Maisel and uh, Maisel in front of their, uh, in front of their Christmas tree in their house. Uh, and it told about a little bit about, uh, Dr. Falwell and about how he celebrated celebrating Christmas in Lynchburg and uh, had a nice little article in that book, a very thick book with lots of beautiful pictures and, and he was in it and, uh, and, uh, and that made me feel good, you know, that uh, of course Dr. Falwell's with the Lord now, and, uh, but uh, it, nonetheless it made me feel good to, uh, to see him that he'll be remembered and, uh, and he was a great man. Now there was a, uh, there's a lot of great sermons been preached through the years, uh, sermons that will never uh, be, forget, uh, be forgotten, uh, like for instance, instance, uh, R.G. Lee preached that great uh, sermon, Payday Someday, and, uh, and it's been um, uh, preached and, and mentioned and, uh, and re-preached a thousand times, uh, and we recognize what a great sermon that was. J. Harold Smith had a great sermon entitled God's Three Deadlines, and by the way, just about every preacher in the country uh, has either heard or read that sermon by, uh, by him on God's uh, Three Deadlines, and it's changed uh, a lot of perspectives and attitudes, uh, uh, and, uh, and and then there's that great sermon by Harold Seitler. I don't know if you uh, remember who Harold Seitler was, but he was pastor of a huge church down in, uh, uh, down in Greenville, South Carolina. He was on the radio, and he was on the radio all across the East Coast. Truck drivers just loved uh, to listen to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, Oliver, uh, to um, uh, Harold Seitler. And, and he had a great sermon, and it was actually on a record album. I remember my cousin brought me the record album. He said, you got to hear this. Uh, and it was a sermon uh, that will long 
long, long, long be remembered by Harold Seitler called Can God. It was a great sermon, powerful sermon, meaningful sermon. One of those sermons that will forever be remembered. Charles Spurgeon, of course, has more sermons uh, uh, recorded that he preached than any other preacher that's ever lived. Uh, and, uh, uh, and yet, uh, Songs in the Night is a famous sermon that, uh, that he preached and it's been mentioned time and time again. And then who could forget Jonathan Edwards' great sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Great preachers down through the years uh, had one sermon many times that kind of stood out and stuck out and, and remained in the hearts and the minds of people long after their death. Uh, and so is true with Dr. Jerry Falwell, uh, the, uh, uh, the founder of the university and, uh, and the founder and pastor until his death of the Thomas Road Baptist Church, that great and marvelous church there in Lynchburg, uh, Virginia. And his great sermon was salt and light. It was from this passage of scripture. And uh, uh, as a matter of fact, it was printed in the sword of the Lord uh, uh, several times. It was printed and then it, it caused such a, uh, a stir. And so many people wanted to, uh, to see it that uh, a number of years later, it was printed again uh, just because uh, so many people were touched and moved by it. It was on uh, the old time gospel hour and they repeated it uh, more than any other sermon he ever preached. Uh, they repeated that, that particular program where he preached that sermon, Salt and Light. And I heard him preach it on more than one occasion. It was a great sermon. It was greatly used. And he approached it uh, from a beautiful, beautiful uh, point of view. This is what he said in a nutshell uh, concerning salt and light. He said, we are to be the salt of the earth. That means that our moral character as Christians, as God's people, we our moral character ought to preserve society to make it a place worth living, to make our community and our towns uh, and our villages uh, and, uh, uh, you know, a, a nice place to live. We, we preserve the goodness of God in our moral character so that we're not afraid to walk the streets at night and, uh, and that we're not afraid uh, uh, to, uh, 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 to send our children out to play and, and we're not afraid to, uh, to be in the, uh, in the main thoroughfares of our towns and, uh, and villages and cities. Uh, if that's going to happen, we need to be the salt of the earth and we have have a preserving quality in this world. And Dr. Falwell said this. He said, you know what? Sometimes it's easier to be light than it is to be salt. Because he said, if you're the light of the world, that means you're fulfilling the great commission. We are the light of the world. We're to testify of the great and glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, he's right. Sometimes it is. Uh, it's hard sometimes to be light, but sometimes it's easier to be the light than it is uh, to be the uh, uh, to be the salt because if you're the salt in this present world and you're going to stand with moral character and fiber, you might be standing totally against the flow of our society today. Is that not true? It is true. It's very true. But that was his message in a nutshell. Jesus gives two illustrations of, uh, of the light. He talks about the light being a city and a candle. And we're going to get to that in the end of the minute, uh, message in just a moment of the city and the candle. But before we do, I just want to uh, make two uh, brief points about the light. First of all, Jesus defines the light. Uh, now, Dr. Falwell did a great job preaching the message, but it is Jesus who defines the light. He gives the definition. If you want to be light in the earth, uh, in the world today, by the way, the title uh, of the message to, uh, this evening is Shine the Light. And so we're going to center our attention for the next few moments on being the light of the world. And Jesus defines it. And if you want to know what it means to be a light in the world, then the best thing to do is to go to the definition that Jesus gives us. No matter how great the sermon, no matter how great the preacher, no matter how marvelous the comment commentator, nothing beats the scripture interpreting itself. And so Jesus gives us the definition uh, of, uh, of being the light. He says, the, he says this, ye are the light of the world, a city that is set uh, on a hill. Uh, he says, uh, he said, neither do men light a candle and uh, put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick and it give the light uh, and it give light unto all that are in the house. Then in verse 16, he defines it. He says, let your light so shine before men. Now notice what he says. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father 
which is in heaven. The definition of the light is your good works manifesting the glory of the Father. That's what the light of your life is. Uh, and you know what? I genuinely believe and am totally convinced that it is that it's important for us to recognize what this light is all about. Uh, I think a lot of preachers, uh, and listen, I believe in being saved by grace, okay? I believe that by grace are you saved through faith. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, and I want you to know that uh, you cannot earn your salvation. You cannot. Uh, it is Jesus Christ and his, uh, and his shed blood on the cross of Calvary. If it were not for Christ shedding his blood on the cross of Calvary, nobody could be saved. Uh, and it is that blood that cleanses me and makes me whole. And I could never earn it. I could never, uh, I could never gain it. Uh, I could never purchase it. It takes the blood of Jesus Christ. And without him, I cannot be saved. But once I am saved by the grace of God and the Holy Spirit of God indwells my being, then I have an obligation to be a light in the world. And the light of the world is my good works. Amen? I'm afraid for a lot of ba uh, Baptists. I know we're not in a Baptist church tonight, but I, I'm a Baptist, church, a Baptist preacher from a Baptist church, and so I can, I can talk about them. Amen? Uh, because I are one. But, but I'm afraid a lot of Baptist preachers sometimes get the idea of that good works is a bad word. But you know what? The, Jesus tells us if we're going to shine our light into the world, then we're going to do it by the power of our good works. Now, we're going to talk about, uh, uh, about, uh, about the uh, deception that can follow sometimes in that. But let's just for the moment take it for face value and let's recognize that they're going to see our good works. And that is our light to the world. Because let me tell you something. When I was 12 years old. I got saved and God did a work in my heart. Amen. He did a work in my heart. Has the Lord ever done a work in your heart? Moved in your, you could feel and sense and know that the Lord Jesus Christ was convicting you, uh, that the Holy Spirit was moving upon you and you knew it down deep in your heart and you responded to what God was doing in your heart and, and God sees the heart and he knows what's in our heart and he draws us by the power of conviction in our heart and then we come and we trust him and he changes our heart and then all of a sudden we now, uh, uh, the things we used to hate we love uh, and we are no longer, uh, we're no longer resisting resistant to Christ and, uh, and we're no longer bitter toward uh, the, uh, the, uh, the word of God or the truth of God. We begin to respond in our heart to these things with an openness and joy uh, and, and a contentment to follow the Lord Jesus Christ in his teachings. But you know what? The world cannot see your heart. Did you know there's a lot of lost people in our communities and they, they can't see my heart. I can't say, look here and there and you'll see I'm saved. Look in there and you'll see I love God. Look in my heart and you'll see, you'll know. No, no. If they're going to see the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, they're going to have to see it in my works. Amen. There's no other way for them to know. If I don't demonstrate the love of God and the mercy of God, I, I remember uh, one time Helen and I had just moved, uh, we had just moved to Lynchburg. As a matter of fact, we had a problem uh, with, uh, uh, with the trailer that we were moving into. We, uh, uh, we, we got there, I, I don't remember, I think it was the water. We couldn't get the water on or whatever. Uh, but anyway, we, we were there, we went to church that Sunday morning and we were sitting near some people and we were telling about that and they said, hey, just come on and have lunch with us. We'll just, you know, we'll just, uh, we'll feed you today. We're like, are, you don't even know us. <laughs> are, you, are you sure you want to do this? Is it safe for you to take us home with you? I mean, you know, but they, they just insisted and, uh, and they showed us, they demonstrated uh, through their good works the love of Christ. I remember one time uh, uh, I, I got stuck in the sand in Texas. Uh, and the last thing you want to do is get stuck in sand in Texas. Because let me tell you something, there's more sand in in Texas than there are stars in the sky. I mean, it is a sandy, sandy, sandy place. And I mean, I buried my truck up in the sand and a guy came along and helped me get my truck out. Worked himself to death. Did things I never even thought of. I was just a, I was just a 20 year old guy out there uh, trying to uh, help a fella get a church started and here this guy comes along and helps me with this. Now, and then I tried to pay him and he said, no, 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 I did this. I did this because I love the Lord and I, I want you to know that. And I, I was shocked. I was stunned. I was amazed. But his good works demonstrated. And you know what? You can say, 
You can say you're a Christian. You really, really love the Lord. You can even leave a track on the table at the restaurant on a Sunday afternoon. And if you put 50 cents in the track, they're going to believe your actions more than your words. Amen? I know that's a sore spot, but it's true. It's true. You, uh, I, it is our good works that demonstrate uh, the love of God. So, uh, so the, the definition of the light into the world is your good works. The world can't see inside of your heart. They can only see your action. And God's works are an outward manifestation of an inward reality. If you really love Christ and you're really following Christ, it's going to change the way you live. And if it's not changing the way you live, it's not real. Amen. I mean, I, I'm, I, that's just, that's just the Bible. That's just what it teaches. I told you it's the last night. We're going to let the hammer down. So, uh, but, but the truth of the matter is, is if you don't, uh, if you, if you're not manifesting the love of Christ in your actions, then there's got to be something wrong in the heart somewhere because it ought to demonstrate the love of God. Uh, so we want to take note of that. But then I want to, I told you we were going to talk about deception just a little bit. And we are. Works can be deceiving. In other words, some people can put on a very good show of works. They never miss church. Uh, they, uh, they never use foul language. They don't smoke. They don't chew. They don't run with them that do. Uh, you know, they, they do all the right things. They, uh, they say the right things at the right time and they act the right ways in the right places. And, uh, and, uh, and they're so sweet, you know, sugar, uh, wouldn't melt in their mouth. And, uh, and you know, you, you, you just, you know, they, they do all the right things, but, but it's all just pretense. It's, it's just a show. And, and, and they can look good on the outside. And Jesus had a word for it. He said, you're like whited sepulchers. You, you look good on the outside, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. That, that's not good. I, I don't want to look good on the outside and be all corrupt on the end, be dead and lifeless and, and, and stinking on the inside. I, 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 instead, I want what's inside to be manifested on the outside. I don't want to cover it up. I don't want to put on a show. But, but, but works can be deceiving. Some people can put on a good show and make everybody believe they're, that they're really, really, really in, in close with the Lord and walking with the Lord when in reality their heart's not right. But let me tell you something. A fellow came to my dad one time and he said, I, I just can't come to church because there's hypocrites there. He said, I can never become a Christian because there's so many hypocrites. And so my father said to him, he said, well, let me ask you this question. He said, he's a middle-aged man. He said, is there anybody in your life that you believe was really, really a genuine good Christian? He said, oh yeah, my, my grandmother and my mother were real Christians. They, they were really Christian people. They were not hypocrites. They were genuine. He said, well, where do you think they went when they died? He said, well, I think they went to heaven. There's no doubt about it. He said, so you won't go to the church or become a Christian because there's hypocrites there. But where are the hypocrites going to go when they die? And he kind of looked at him funny. He said, well, I don't, I don't really think they're going to go to heaven. And my dad said to him, he said, well, there's only two places. So if they're not going to heaven, where are they going? He said, well, I, I guess they're going to hell. He said, so let me ask you this question. Do you want to go to heaven with your mother and grandmother or do you want to go to hell with all the uh, hypocrites you wouldn't go to church with? And he said, well, you know, I really don't want to go to hell uh, with anybody, let alone the hypocrites. You see, yes, it's true some people are not real. Yes, it's true that some people are not genuine. Yes, it's true that for every, uh, for every uh, true, dedicated uh, man and woman of God who's living for God and manifesting the love of Christ, Satan's going to throw out some faults. He's going to throw out some hypocrites. But that doesn't mean that, uh, that we cannot have that reality. As a matter of fact, the very, the very fact that we see the hypocrites demonstrates to us that there's got to be someone somewhere real somewhere because they're pretending to be what they're not and somebody's got to be the genuine article. Amen? So let's take a look at this and just uh, uh, and consider it a little bit. Uh, the, let your light so shine that they may see your good works. Now, that's an interesting phrase. Let your light so shine. Let your light so shine that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. In other words, the word so here means let your light, let your light shine in such a way, in such a manner that when they look at you, they see your good works and glorify your Father. You see, if you want to know whether or not somebody's a hypocrite or not, then take a look at who's getting the credit for the way they're living. Amen? 
If they're taking the credit, oh, look at what a great guy I am. Aren't I a nice guy? Aren't I a sweet fellow? Don't you, don't you just love me? <laughs> don't you just think I'm wonderful? Don't you want to follow me because I'm such a great guy? Or is that person more like this? Well, I, I'm not much in this life. I'm really not. But the Lord sure has been good to me. The Lord forgave me when I was lost in sin. And the Lord filled me with his goodness and his grace. And the Lord sent so many Christian people to help me and encourage me that if there's any way that I can be a help to you, if there's any way I can be an encouragement to you, if there's any way that I can help you along life's way, please just let me know because I want to show you that Jesus cares. That God loves you. You see, that's a totally different attitude uh, in our good works. If we're doing our good works like the Pharisees to be seen of men, that's one thing. But if we're doing our good works because we love Jesus with all of our heart and with all of our soul, and we would like to be a uh, uh, we would like to be a reflection of His glory, so we can put men on the road uh, to salvation and put their face toward the one who loves them most, my friend. Then that good Good work glorifies our Father which is in heaven. And then that's exactly what the Lord wants us to do. He wants our light to shine just that way, bringing others to the Father. Now, I said we were going to close with a look at the city and the candle. So now we know what, what the light's about. We understand the definition of letting our light so shine in this world. But Jesus doesn't doesn't just stop there. Notice what he says. Look at verse 15. He says in verse 14, you're the light of the world. And then he says, a city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. Then in verse 15, he says, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. So there's two ways he describes, he defines the light. The definition of the light is our good works manifesting the glory of the Father. But then he describes the light. He gives us two descriptions of the light, two illustrations, if you would, of the light. One is a city that's set on a hill and the other is a candle that's in the house. My, uh, my, my in-laws lived in Texas. My wife was from there and um, we went, I went to college in Lynchburg, Virginia. So my family lived in Georgia and her family lived in Texas, and we were living in Virginia. Uh, it's a long way from any one of those points to any of the others. Uh, and so we used to make the trip. And you know what? We found out that we could, now we were, we were not smart back then, uh, and we were broke. If you're a college student, you're broke. Especially this college student, because I, uh, I paid my way through college by working another job. Uh, and, uh, but anyway, so we were broke, and we weren't smart, and we were young. So when we got ready to go to Texas, we just got in the car and drove. We didn't stop at the motel. We, we, you know, we didn't spend the night on the way. Uh, I mean, it was, what, 17 hours? And we just got in the car and we just drove. We drove until we were silly. We just drove. Uh, and we'd stop. And the, all four doors of the car would open, and me and my wife, and, uh, and, uh, and well, Rebecca wasn't really old enough to hop out of the car at that point, but uh, my son and my daughter would be with us. And then we had to do whatever we were going to do real quick. You had to go to the bathroom and fill up with gas and buy a burrito at the gas station, and in the car we go because we got to get there. And away we go. Well, we were driving one time, and we decided to take a little bit different route, and so we were, we were going through Arkansas. And so when we first got into Arkansas, it was kind of hilly. And then all of a sudden it flattened out. Have you ever noticed that Arkansas can be really, really flat? Anybody here ever been to Arkansas? All right. You know, it's flat. I mean, it, there's parts of it that's hilly, but when you get to the flat spot, it's flat, flat. I mean, flat, like a pancake is flat. And so we're driving along and uh, we look and we see the lights of the city. It's, it's nighttime and we see the lights of the city. And boy, that was comforting. We got to be close to Little Rock. Because look at the, we can see the lights. And we drove for about an hour. And honest to goodness, I believe it was further away. We could still see the lights. But we, we just didn't look like we were any closer. We drove like two hours and 15 minutes from the time we saw the lights of Little Rock before we finally got there. I honestly believe it was running away from us. I mean, it was crazy. Why was that? Because it, it Little, Little Rock 
is on a little rock. <laughs> it's on a hill about that high. <laughs> but it's so flat that even though it's just a little hill and it's sitting out there, you can see it from everywhere because it's a city set on a hill and you can see it from all over the place. For two and a half hours out, 110 miles you, away from it in the middle of the night, you can see the lights of the city from that distance. And could I say to you that the church is a city that's set on a hill? Now, let me tell you something, okay? It's set on a hill, and Jesus says it cannot, it cannot be hid. Now, when he talked about the candle, he said you can hide it under a bushel. But when he talked about the city, he says the city cannot be it. Let me tell you something. You are going, your church is going to have an impact in this community, whether you like it or not. Yes. Amen. Amen. You're either going to be a light for good. You're either going to be a demonstration of God's grace. You're either going to be an expression of God's mercy. You're either going to be a show of God's goodness into this community. And the fact that life can be found in Jesus Christ and the power of God can change the life of the sinner. Or you're going to be a demonstration of hypocrisy and, uh, and contentiousness and brokenness and woundedness. My friend, it is up to you to be a city that shines out with the glory love and manifestation of God because they're going to remember you. They're going to know you one way or the other because the church is a city set on a hill and, and they're going to know you. I, I remember one time we were, I was candidating for a church that I didn't get, of course, but anyway, I was candidating for a church uh, down in uh, South Georgia one time, uh, uh, right, not too terribly long after I got out of college. Uh, and, uh, but I got down there and, and I was talking uh, to some of the people in the community and we were meeting some of the people and they got to talking about another church in that community. And you know what? We talked to several people. In that town and in that community, some from the church where I was candidating, some from other places and other churches. And you know what? We didn't hear them say one, not one good thing was ever said about that church. Basically, you get the idea that you do not want to have any contact with that church. Isn't that sad? Isn't that terrible? Isn't that awful? Isn't that a terrible testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ? That that church was so, and, and I think what had happened was, is they got mad at each other. One group got mad at another group. And so uh, when, the, when the pastor got to church one Sunday morning, a group of them had padlocked the door and wouldn't let them in. And guess what? It's just something like that that's going to make the news. <laughs> you know? So the reputation of that church was destroyed in that community because the Folks inside that church didn't love each other and care for one another and comfort one another and strengthen one another. They were too busy fussing and fighting and couldn't get along. They, they should have been a city set on a hill to manifest the love of, and the grace of God. But instead, they were a laughing stock in the community. This church is a city set on a hill. It's going to have a reputation in your community. It's going to do something good and positive and powerful and meaningful or, 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 it, or it's not. It's going to do the opposite. We want to be the light of the world. Amen. We want to demonstrate and manifest the goodness and the grace of God. I remember, I'm going to use this quick little illustration. I'm almost done. Y'all stay with me. I use this illustration because it happened to me. Not very long ago, and, it, and I think it's, it sets well with it. I, it was a Saturday, and it was one of those rare Saturdays for a pastor that I literally, really, genuinely, honestly had the day off. Most pastors are busy on Saturday. I don't know if you know this or not, but it's true. You either have a wedding or a funeral. Uh, you, the, the, a lot of weddings happen on Saturdays. Uh, and so you either have a wedding or a funeral. Uh, or you have, a, you have somebody's uh, birthday party. Uh, or you have some activity. Or you have the, the WMU plans a lot of stuff on Saturday, Saturdays. And, uh, and then you have a lot of outings that happen on Saturdays. So it was a lot of, but this Saturday I was free. I had a free day. I was marvelous. And so I got up that morning and I was so excited that I had the day off. And I had to run a couple of errands. So I had to go to Rising Sun, Maryland, which is four and a half miles from the house. And then I had to go to Oxford, Pennsylvania, which is on the other side. You had to come back past my house and then go another five miles north. So I had to go four and a half miles south, then get back on the road and go uh, nine and a half miles north and then come back another five miles to get home. I mean, how long is that going to take, right? I mean, there's nothing to it. 
I mean, you know, I'm right in the middle between these two towns and I got to get these things done. No problem. So I go down. So I go, I decided to go to Oxford first. So I got in the car and went to Oxford and I got to Oxford and the streets were blocked. They were having a, they were having a parade. And they had all these booths out there of all this stuff. And I mean, they had every, everybody there. I mean, they had the Lions Club and they had the Rotary Club and they had the, uh, they had the uh, school administration was there and they had all these different things going on and all this, uh, all these people. And I mean, the park was just covered up. It took me 45 minutes just to get where I was going. Man. Then I finally got through in, in Oxford. About an hour later than I wanted to be, I started the Rising Sun. Guess what? They're having a fun run in Rising Sun. So they got all these little kids running down the road and they're throwing colored stuff on them. I don't know what they do exactly, but when they get through, they're all these bright colors and they go, oh, look at that, they pretty. And they're running down there and the road's blocked because they're having a fun run. Well, guess what? When I got up to the park in Rising Sun, it was the same kind of deal. They had hot dogs and they had barbecue and they had balloons and cotton candy and they had this group represented and that group represented and another group represented. And I'm telling you, I like to never got out of rising sun. Praise God, there wasn't nothing going on in Nottingham. <laughs> but as I was leaving rising sun, this is what I thought. I shouldn't have had the day off. I shouldn't have had. Our church should have been involved in one of these events, if not both of them that day, showing the love and the grace and the mercy of Christ to our community because we live there. This is where we are. And I thought, Lord, what an opportunity we missed. We, 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 we just, we didn't even think about it. We, it never even crossed our mind. What an opportunity we missed. We had a chance here that we could have made a difference. We had a chance. We could have met people. We had a chance. We could have, we could have shown the grace of God. We had a chance that we could have manifested the goodness of Christ. And we just blew it. We just weren't there. I'm not saying our church has a bad reputation by any stretch of the imagination, but I, I recognize something. We don't want to miss our opportunities to contact our community with the love of Christ and the demonstration of his love. Notice the next thing. The city is the church. It's set on a hill and it ought to glorify the father and it cannot be hid. You know where I'm going with this, don't you? The candle is you. Every born again believer in here, you should be a candle. You remember when you were little and you used to sing, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no. I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no. I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Did y'all do this first? Don't let Satan it out. I'm gonna let it shine. Don't let Satan it out. I'm gonna let it shine. Don't let Satan it out. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. You see, the church cannot be hid, but you can hide your light. You can be so quiet and so reserved and so out of the way that nobody would ever even guess that you're a Christian. Oh, if you don't want the people at work to know you're a Christian, you, 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 don't, you, don't, have to, you don't have to cuss with them. You don't have to tell wicked stories. You, 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 don't, you, don't, have to, you don't have to go with them and, and get drunk. You, you, you can just, just kind of stand out of the way. And when they mention anything, you can just kind of keep yourself quiet and nobody will ever know you're a Christian. And boy, what you've accomplished and you know what? You know what Paul said? Paul said, if our treasure is hid, it's hid to them that's lost. You know what that means? If you're hiding your candle under a bushel so they won't know that you're a Christian, you're keeping the light of the gospel from the people who need it most. Amen? 
You're, you're, you're keeping the truth of God's love and his mercy and his grace. You're, you're hiding it from the people that are needing it most. And you, <laughs> you have a choice. You can let your light shine or you can hide it. You can keep it from them. You can take it away. Now, the first time I ever read this passage of scripture, when I was really thinking about it, I thought, man, that's a crazy idea. I grew up in Georgia and my grandparents were farmers and a bushel basket was, uh, was, was, you know, it was made out of straw and it was woven together. And I tell you, I thought, boy, that's not a very very good idea to put a put a candle under a bushel. I mean that you're gonna set the house on fire. What's wrong with it? And, and you know what? I still kind of look at it that way. It's really crazy to hide your candle. It really is. It's really not a good idea. It's really not smart to hide the burning, glorious manifestation of the illumination of God's love in your life to hide that from a world that so desperately needs it. And let me tell you one other thing. When we were in Wales as missionaries, and I'll close with this, I wanted to do something one time and a couple of my deacons weren't very happy, but they let me do it anyway. (laughs) And fortunately, I got away with it. We came in one night and we had our youth group And our youth group was all over the building. And they had little baskets with them. And in the baskets, they had candles. And when we got to a certain point in the service, they started passing the candles out to all the church members. And I I got my candle and I got my match and I lit my candle and I blew the match out and I held my candle out. And the first thing is, is I had, I had, uh, I had the teenagers come around and they stuck their candle out and my candle lit their candle and then my candle lit his candle and my candle lit his candle and I lit all the candles of all the teenagers and then all the all the younger kids stood up and held their candles up and then all the teenagers went and lit the candles of the kids and while they were doing that, then the rest of the youth leaders was passing the candles out to the adults and then all the kids and the teenagers started lighting the candles of all the adults in the building. And when we got through, nobody had noticed that all the lights had been turned out because the candle power was so great. The light from everybody's candle filled the place. You realize that your city that's set on a hill that can't be hid, it's made out of your light and your light and your light, and your light, and your light, and your light. It's made up of each one of you. It is your candle that is illuminating the world. It is is you that is demonstrating the grace and the love and the mercy of God to a lost and dying world. Because if the Christians don't do it, nobody else can. If the born again believers in the churches of America do not hold out the light and say, we want to be the light of the world. We want to show the love of Christ to those who desperately need it. If we don't do it with our good works, then nobody else will. Because Jesus told us. He told his disciples. He told his followers. He told those who believed in him. You're the salt of the earth. And you're the light of of the world. It's up to you to light this community with the love of Christ. Dear Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to bring the message tonight. Lord, I pray you'd touch us with its truth. Lord, Lord, even pastors get a little lackadaisical sometimes, at least I do, of really trying to demonstrate the love of God, especially to people who are hard to deal with and hard to understand and community situations that are that are awkward lord sometimes we just want to hide the light but oh dear god of heaven we want to hear you and heed your words and we want to be a light to this dark and lonely world and we want to be a city that's set on a hill and a candle that puts out light in our house and in our community and for the glory of god now on this last night that we're together May, may we agree together to commit afresh, to open a new uh, avenue in our heart and in our life where we would be more firmly settled that dear Lord God of heaven, teach me to be the light. Show me how to lighten this dark world.
We pray it in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.